So that's the first question. Do they exist? So um, this happened several years ago when I was a room fellow. I was learning how to fry a turkey. And so <laughs> that could be a rheumatology emergency. You guys ever done this? Yeah, like as soon as you drop the bird in, it like goes, it turns into a volcano, and there's like oil is everywhere and splattering and makes a big mess. So, um, beware. So, in rheumatology, we take care of a lot of multi system autoimmune diseases, and some of these can present emergently. Um, certainly, going through training, it really feels like lupus is not that uncommon of an Ill illness because you'll see a lot in hospitals, in rheumatology fellowship. Um, it is dramatically less common disease than, say, rheumatoid arthritis, which rarely has any kind of inpatient. There are a couple to talk about. Scleroderma is one that you'll see here not infrequently um, because Dr. Virginia Steen is here, and she's one of the global experts on the topic of scleroderma. Um, and there's a lot of problems that can happen to people, whether they're chronic issues or acute issues, that can land them in the hospital. Vasculitis, um, my former division chief was um, uh, Dr. Cups, and Dr. Cups and Fauci had put together a case series on treating what was then called Wegener's granulomatosis, and they were the first people to treat that with, um, with cyclophosphamide outline how to do that. Um, so we've, we've been a vasculitis center um, since then. Rheumatoid arthritis can have some things that present in this way. Um, anything that has the name catastrophic in it can present emergently. So catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, you get clotting and all these kinds of things. Um, I'm on my text thread with some rheumatologists, and so I see the word can and can you map popping up, and I'm like, oh, okay. um, do that later. Giant cell arteritis, that's actually one we do see pretty commonly in the hospital. We have somebody going for a biopsy today, um, negative, but we, um, huh? But you never know, sometimes you have to look. Um, septic arthritis, when that comes up, that could be emergent. Cricopharyngeal disease, that's really, I'll go over that in Atlanta axial subluxation. Those are two things that you'll see in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and then rheumatology in the ICU. There's things like scleroderma renal crisis, uh, which I'll go over. Raynaud's phenomenon, you don't think of Raynaud. Raynaud seems pretty innocent kind of disease, except when it's not. So people with scleroderma sometimes have really severe Raynaud's and they start losing fingers. Um, for those people, we'll bring them in for um, people prostanol infusion. Um, really convinced that that works very well, but it probably does. Um, right. So, you've got a nice lady who comes in to see you. She's complaining she's got cold hands. Even though she bought the most expensive, fanciest mittens, she still gets cold fingers. Um, she's feeling fatigued and tired, not quite feeling herself. Um, and in fact, She's really noted some a lot of hand symptoms just even beyond the cold. Sometimes there's some numbness and tingling. Um, and in fact, she gets diagnosed with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome and you know has some treatments for that. Um, just know about like median nerve distribution and how that presents and how it's like half of the ring finger and then the other fingers. Um, anything that causes swelling in this compartment and then over to this screen. I don't want to do it. Anything that causes swelling in here, um, the guy that's going to lose is the nerve. I don't know, nerves are not as tough as tendons and ligaments. Ligaments and there's like rope. You can squeeze rope, it doesn't really hurt it. Squeeze a nerve you cut off the flow of the natural nerve juice that's around the nerve and symptoms. And we've all felt that feeling when we've sort of sat somewhere and compressed the nerve. All right, so then here are the hands. And what do you guys notice here? 
have fingernail polish. Skin looks a little bit shiny, yeah. Puffy. Like you take that skin on the hand, like take your own hand. You brought them. On and um, so the finger, just kind of pinch the skin here and here and on the back of your hand. Now you're supposed to do that tenting that thing, but you can just kind of squeeze the skin and and notice how you can't like it's loose. Take the bottom skin and turn it to the top, tethering into the bone that you're. Um, you can pinch it, and it's like. Kind of, do that on this person. It would be kind of tight up top, past the CIP, into the dorsum of the hand, and maybe it's starting to go up the arm. So, then on this person, when you examine them, you put your hands here. And have them open and close their hand. Like with your fingertips, hear or sense a sound. Feel. Or if you felt on the wrist, and do the same thing. And it's for sure. Or you could feel down here. Have the person's ankle and have them dorsiflex and plantar flex. And just feel it. That's a really uncommon find. So someone who has new onset of rhinos, maybe bilateral or carpal tunnel, has tightened skin that's starting to go up the arm, what do you think they have? What if you did your testing and the hand of people that have uh, scleroderma, the majority of them have a positive ANA. There's a good portion of them that have an ANA that's positive in a nucleolar pattern. Our target, not ones that are uh, commonly tested for. Um, and therefore, if you're Doing an ANA test where what they've done is they've picked full-strain of DNA, 70 centimeter, done like a multi-B MISA assay, other kinds of polar. Have people where you're like, Irma and the ANA. Okay with that? Um, for ANA in more detail. Okay. So anyway, so you see her, and um, actually she's feeling pretty crummy. And you check her blood pressure, and you're like, whoa, 203 over 114. Like, that's not good. And you ask her, like, what's your blood pressure normally, Rush? She's like, well, it's normally like 110, 70. run down, she's now short of breath. Um, you set off labs, her creatinine comes back at two and a half. That's how it's going to show up. And the lab pattern of that, the other things you'll often see would be microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. What happens when you have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, kidney failure? What's another thing? Right? And if this person's a little bit confused and short of breath and looking terrible, um, so it's actually in your differential when you're trying to sort out TTP, because this person has scleroderma renal crisis. It's, that's very, very meaningful to separate 
because the the new onset hypertension, they sometimes have flash pulmonary edema, so they can get pretty sick. Sometimes they'll land in the ICU. And you'll get called, like, on a newly diagnosed scleroderma patient, like, oh, I'm in the ICU, and um, they tell me I have congestive heart failure and kidney failure, and they'll list all these things and maybe not necessarily pull all the threads together. Um, bland sediment, because it's a hypertensive nephropathy. Hemolysis, schistocytes, low platelets. Okay. So then... Um, Going back, how do you treat TT? We'll put in a line. Um, how do you treat sclerodoma renal crisis? And it's one of the only room things where there's like a nobody argues about an answer. It's like um, it's tried hard. Where's what work? Right. So in the world of test questions, one right answer is really definitive. Kind of an obscureish thing. This is a great test question. And it always shows up on the room board. Almost always shows up on the medical board. Um, and the other reason for that is that, um, uh, in general, uh, people that have this didn't treat them, did very badly, but people uh, who got identified as having this and got treated with ACE inhibitors, they do pretty well. Okay. Um, most of them have are high blood pressure occasionally, and these are the ones where we need Dr. Steen to help out when it's like normotensive renal crisis and then these kinds of things. And then this is also an unusual situation where somebody can get so sick and their kidneys can get so bad that they need to be on dialysis, but you keep treating them and sometimes that can reverse. And like most reasons that you end up on dialysis. Uh, most people uh, who get this, it's early in the course of their scleroderma. It's pretty much always in diffuse scleroderma. Um, and then the female to male ratio is uh, typical for scleroderma. Um, the bulk have diffuse skin involvement, but there are some people that have a more limited presentation. But none of those people had the antibody for centuries. Um, they had like obscure, obscure ones. Other things that can give you. Sometimes I see anti STL 70 people with limited skin presentation. Um, so, but this is the big one RNA polymerase 3 for this. Um, all right, so these are the ones that don't get picked up in those ANA choice, uh, anti-THTO, PMSCL, E3, RMP, right? This is the obscure stuff that my fellows have to know. You don't need to know. You just need to know that there's stuff that's missing in certain kinds of ANA assays. Um, these are outcomes. So if you recognize this and treated it, people tend to do well. If you don't, people die. So dichotomous. Um, and if you're delayed, then people have kidney failure and have complications from Okay. All right. So, if someone was to ask you, like in a week, like how do you treat scleroderma renal crisis? You would say ACE inhibitors. Great. Okay. Beat that home. Dead horse. Okay. Um, 
So one other thing, it's interesting, when they go back and they look, is definite causation? Uh, because people who are sicker and go to a, a rheumatologist or just are sicker in general get put on more steroids, but it's, there's an association between a higher probability of having renal crisis um, if you had been put on more than 15 milligrams. This is, this is observation of cohort. Or just sicker. Or, yeah. Yeah. Like, for instance, there's an inverse association between wearing high heel shoes and knee osteoarthritis. With high heel shoes, have less knee osteoarthritis. So, then, like, if you looked at maps of it's the Barack Obama one, and put them with maps where there's prevalence of Lyme disease. And so sometimes when things are there, they're not necessarily linked. I don't think the ticks are about or the deer. Okay, but you can see like big odds ratio there. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to another. T oh. Um, That slide doesn't want to agree with me. Okay, um, this was uh, this was never published, but it was a, a case report presented years ago at the American College of Rheumatology, and I thought it was just useful because um, they took a few people and they just tried to oh, let's treat them with an arm, and it didn't work. And then they had people who were on an ACE, but for whatever reason, maybe they had some side effects. Pushed them to an arm, and they got worse. Um, or it didn't work, and then they add an R to an ACE that did metric activity. All right. What kind of bird is this? Heard it, and it went. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Bird, would you say it was? Cuckoo bird, yeah. <laughs> right, so like sometimes like you can look at something, you're like, uh, I'm not sure, it's kind of. But um, use all the clues. Sometimes you got to listen for the sound or the smell or whatever. All right, so let's go to a case. Uh, Here's a 54-year-old man. He's uh, he's in good health. He rides like 30 miles a couple times a week. Um, then he gets some uh, cough, not feeling so good. He's got sinusitis that's been building up over the last year or so, um, sometimes with some blood. Um, and he's getting some joint pain. All right? So now he comes to see you, and he's he's really short of breath. Um, he's like panting, uh, no longer doing these long bike rides, and uh, he shows you like his handkerchief and he's got blood on it. And you, you start remembering that story with the Toreador and the TB and like, well, maybe this is something else. Um, got tachycardia, probably because he's sick, it's sinus. Um, and then you look at his fingernails and you see these little things. What are these guys? What does that make you think of? Endocarditis. Yeah, so you're like, oh, maybe it's endocarditis. How do I put all these things together? Um, in fact, you, you get lab work, and he's got some anemia. White cell count is mild. Um, but the creatinine is 3.2. got protein in the urine and greater than 50 red cells. So... What are you guys thinking? Can we not call it white hair? Good pastures. 
are the key things for a pulmonary renal failure? Well, in this world, like if you're seeing somebody you're being called in the ICU, and it's like oh, I got a pulmonary renal. Pastures. Always. And uh, keep in mind that like things like good pastures, pastures presents on its own, relatively treat while we're waiting to pick up the feet. And sometimes good pastures, at least a portion of the time, it overlaps with anchor. All right, so um, we're getting our NAs, or we get a lot of that, but these are the ones I'm really caring about, like ones that I'm bugging my phone and say, what's the bios and so what's the treatment for good pastures? Plasma freezes, plasma exchange. Um, or anchor disease. We'll talk about it if you want. Steroids. When do you not use steroids? Third armor radio first. Okay, so let's go over some vasculitis emergencies. Um, so first off, as you're thinking about vasculitis, think about vasculitis in terms of the, there's a structural way to think about it. Am I dealing with large vessel, medium vessel, or small vessel? The way that I think about it, who gets takiyasu's or titus? Who gets or giant holder. It's separation right there. But sometimes people with takiyasu keep living. Some older, and they may present at that time, but it's usually the onset of symptoms of prior to age 40. When did people get giant cell arteritis? It's always after 50. Like somebody younger than 50, it's just not. You have a case report, you're going to be like, I'm the only person that has it. Then you go back and you saw the exchange there. Medium vessel vasculitis. Polyarteritis nervosa. It used to be the term that was used for every kind of vasculitis. Now it's actually their entity. Um, and Kawasaki's disease. Who gets Kawasaki's disease? Okay, how do they present? Do I have any med these people now? Uh, we yeah. did. Med so how does <laughs> how does Kawasaki's disease present? Oh, like the like red rash first. everywhere. They, they can have a little bit of a rash. Unrelenting fever for um, if I can see. It. Yeah, not, you're going to see it. Some people, like, can you treat that with? 
Aspirin and IVIG. Complications from that one that are downstream that you do have to be aware of? What, what, what specific thing? Aneurysms of the coronary vasculature. Okay, so again, for a medium vessel arteritis, if you're diagnosing it in the 40 year old, is it Kawasaki's disease? Or stenosis? Or then, you know, as you're thinking in your mind, um, and somebody's asking, hey, is this a large, medium, or small vessel? So that everything else is small vessel vasculitis, including the first four. So they can sort of extend and overlap into sizes, but their dominant thing will be small vessel. Then anybody here a Tar Heel? Good, good. I went to Duke. So, um, but anyway, this is the Chapel Hill consensus. On this, and you can see sort of how, like, you know, anchor disease can spread into medium vessels um, and so on. But, all right, so here's somebody with mononeuritis multiplex and wrist drop. Got his VA outfit on. Um, so, mononeuritis multiplex uh, is uh, injury to a named peripheral nerve, and you everything that it does. If this is happening, it's the little blood vessels that are feeding the nerves that have been killed. Marking that structure. Here, this is a shot of the kidney. Yes? Well, they're pretty much up in all these. So, like, for instance, no, this is important because there are there are non-arteritic vascular diseases that mimic these, arterial and medial lysis, non-inflammatory disease. There's um, fibromuscular dysplasia. But as you're looking at it and you're looking at the image, the rate and CRP are totally normal. The rate is high, you're thinking about it. And CRP can be high because of infection as well. You ever check them in a COVID patient? Like 300, 300, it's crazy. All right. Here you have aneurysmal dilatation, sort of in, intraparenchymally. This, it's like from the 1920s, this is right? um, But you see, like, dilated. Um, aneurysmal vessel formation, narrowings, and so on. Now this, I'll just have you read for a second. This was the original description of polyarteritis nodosa. Somebody that's having these kinds of problems where they're infarcting parts of their body are just Okay, so the the way that vasculitis injures structures in the gut, which is the emergent presentations, um, you can infarct the bowel or you can have aneurysmal rupture and then bleeding. Um, and then Dr. Cups used to like to talk about if you also happen to have something like antiphospholipid syndrome or an inherited thrombosis disease, and you've got something disrupting the the uh, the vessel itself, you can like that's just a terrible kind of combo of illness. Um, polyarteritis nodosa as a diagnosis is really, really rare. So I've just seen a handful in the whole time I've done any kind of rheumatology. We look for it, but all the other arteritis syndromes are more common. So here's, this is a case series where from 1986 to 2000 at Hopkins, where they also have a big vasculitis center, they were able to find 54 patients. To include. Not common, right? Anybody regionally with this kind of a problem is going to get sent to a place like there or here or, or what have you. Um, but when it's present, you just have to be aware. Um, so the historic mortality is that um, when people had a lot of abdominal involvement, that was a, a fairly universally fatal type of process. 
but they were able to lower the mortality quite a bit by being aggressive, steroids, treating with cyclophosphamide, et cetera. Um, um, but as I said, you know, I think things that they would have called PAN in the past, we could probably better classify or identify now. Okay, so um, this is not necessarily a, a classic room emergency, but just one to be aware of. So if you have a patient on high doses of steroids um, and they start complaining of some abdominal symptoms, just pay that a lot of mind because steroids can uh, mask the normal response that you might have to bowel perforation. Uh, I've definitely come in on a weekend and see a nice, you know, 70-year-old person on a lot of steroids who said, oh, I feel gassy, and she had bowel perforation. Um, and so just go ahead, and if you have any question about this, you get a flattener or a Um, so polyarteriosidosa in the skin. Um, I won't say this is PAM. This this would be like any kind of leukocytic leukocytoclastic vasculitis. And if you were to put your finger up here on the screen and feel it, what would you feel? I think you're going to feel smooth glass, but really, what you're going to feel, you're going to feel like bumps under that thing. And what's causing that to occur? palpable purple. Why doesn't it blanch? Yeah, so that blood is leaked out. So it's there. It's it's stuck there now, right? And so you press on it, it doesn't disappear. It's not like in the vessel like um, a telangiectasia. occasion. Um, here you have somebody where there's a larger vessel feeding the skin, a perforating vessel, and it's in and So now you have a crater. When you see somebody with a skin rash that's cratering out, think about, like, is it something that's killing the blood vessel leading to it? A big portion of the people who go and see Dr. Attinger down uh, for chronic wounds, at least a segment of them have immune-mediated wounds. And that's why they actually hire one of our rheumatology graduates work there in the wound center and a lot of their patients. All kinds of weird, you know, next patient. So this is a 36-year-old who comes in, uh, rash on the ear, face, and trunk. I hope that's a man or a woman. What do you want to know? Uh, this started over the past month. Yeah, it's getting more purple. We had a little bit of it fell off over here. <laughs> uh, yeah, it hurts. Uh, both, but more on that one. Get back a white cell count of 2.8, positive ANA, positive Pianca, positive anti MPO, positive anti PR3. Positive anti-cardiolipin and IgM, and you're like, all right, I give up. What's going on? <laughs> it gives you, like, wacky labs, low white cell counts. Could be lupus? You guys seen this person before? Um, 
You do more of a social history. You're like, drink alcohol, yeah, I drink alcohol. Do you any drugs? No, I don't do any. You sometimes do drugs. Yeah, well, sometimes sometimes a little bit of coke. In cocaine. Exactly. That's why we keep Chase here. Um, so, when you're selling your cocaine, right? I don't know if you've watched Patron de Mal, which is a 65 part mini series in Spanish from Colombia, or if you watch Narcos, which is like a 12 part mini series, it goes into the excruciating detail of everything about Pablo Escobar. Um, but you sell it by weight, and like that was his innovation, is to make bricks of cocaine, and you could organize and count them, and if somebody didn't pay you the right amount, kill them. Um, um, but an innovative guy. Uh, um, one thing you're doing, if you're selling a product by weight, is to add something cheaper but that can weight and not get tested with the roadside testing. With, you're checking. Bamisol can be added. It was plentiful. It's used for um, that. Anyway, people who inadvertently take levamisol because they don't know they're taking levamisol was in about 65 to 70 percent of the cocaine supply uh, was in the U.S. in the last. Um, they get this thrombotic. Disease, cutaneous thrombotic disease, and they get wacky uh, lab tests that don't make sense. Low uh, white blood cell count. Treatment of this is to what? Yeah, no more levamisol. That also means no more cocaine. That can be challenging. Uh, we did have a patient who was a healer. That was just not something they were. Um, the other interesting person we had, we had somebody come in with vasculitis or ANCA positive being treated for ANCA vasculitis, and then their spouse came in with, also with ANCA vasculitis. We have two people having this kind of rare disease, start looking for this kind of thing. It turned out it was cocaine associated with aerosol causing positive ANCAs and vasculitic type. All right, steroids. Sometimes it gives you a little bit of heartburn. Um, this was in Morocco. A 42-year-old who comes in for ovarian cyst removal. She had an MBA with head trauma three months ago. Uh, she'd been treated with extended courses dexamethasone. Yeah, she's doing okay. Post op, sort of shocky. Give her a whole bunch of fluid replacement. So what do you think might be going on? Okay. Oops. Oh, come on. Thought that they gave her with hydrocortisone, and boom, she got better. So the symptoms of this can be uh, mild all the way to severe, like vascular collapse. Um, you know, and like one of the informal rules we have in rheumatology is never lower steroids over the holidays because you know it's easy access to care. I remember seeing somebody like almost at Christmas on saw and just like pop their steroids and like about to collapse in the clinic. Um, so you need to know how to manage somebody who's been on the equivalent of prednisone, 20 milligrams per day or more, um, somebody on these moderate doses, or 5 milligrams or less. So almost all the recommendations that I've been able to find, and periodically I just rerun this lit review, 
um, it's mostly dogmatic type stuff because somebody had somebody that had cardiovascular collapse. Um, most people, even if they've been on steroids for a long time, this is not going to happen to them. They'll still have some reserve. Um, um, but that being said, in general, people who are on 15 or more or 20 or more, those are the folks at risk. And then in who have Cushing type. They just seem I had a person with polyatarist nodosa who was um, didn't have a good place to live and would he would be on steroids, 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 and then stop his steroids and then collapse down in the park and then brought in and they would see him and he'd be John Doe, but oh he's cushing and they would give him steroids and he'd wake back up. Um, you need to know a little bit about the differences between some of the steroids. That given equivalent dose, like hydrocortisone 20 equals methylpred 4 or prednisone 5. I'm 5, like that's very happy. You also need to know that the biologic half life is very different for these. And the last thing you need to know is that the mineralocorticoid is like the reverse. Like this has much more, and this has almost none. Classic, like endocrine, you actually need to know your physiology. So how much, I can't think in terms of cortisol because I never prescribe cortisol. I sometimes have to use hydrocortisone for people, but I do use prednisone. So really I should say, how much prednisone do you make? What is that when you're not for stress? Phone call, and I'm saying we'll have the like two. We're in that zone. And then sometimes, like, as you get more stress, it can go up higher. Um, and then, like, severe stress, like, tragic shock kind of thing, um, it will be. So in terms of cortisol, that goes into the 8 to 25. Okay. And that's, that's where we, you know, with cortisol, up to 150 during times of stress, and that's why we sometimes say, all right, stress those steroids, we're going to give the thing that's closest to cortisol, hydrocortisone, and we're going to give it three times a day. And then, you know, those are one of the protocols we use. Uh, don't get too fussy over, like, exactly how much. It's a little bit like wearing a seatbelt. As long as you put a seatbelt on, you're okay. Point seatbelt or a four-point seatbelt or a five. I don't know what they wore when they were flying into space. Yeah. Um, they probably wear a serious seatbelt. So this is the group that you really have to be cognizant of, right? They've been on 20 for more than three weeks. They have Cushing features. And everybody else kind of keep them on their steroid dose, and if there's problems, just know to give them. So for testing for that, we can do uh, ACTH stimulation test. Um, high dose or low dose. Um, there's also an insulin-induced hypoglycemia test, which an endocrine fellow is supposed to do at least once during their training. Insulin, they kind of start to go into shock, and then they 
football, right? Like, six. <laughs> You're hanging out in the call room. Like, how are we going to figure this out? Let's try that. All right. This this was my boat back in the day. This is my boat shared with five other residents. We moonlit for a weekend and we put our money together and we bought a crappy little boat. Awesome investment. And it was fun when it worked, but it rarely did because it was six guys owning a boat and not taking care of it. All right. So in the last couple minutes we'll go over rheumatoid arthritis. Um and I want to talk about two things. So uh, atlantoaxial subluxation. Okay. So rheumatoid arthritis can affect this. Uh, this is C2. C2 is like a huge, awesome vertebra. C1 is like a little tiny little guy. It's just like a ring. The body, where the body of C1 should have been, C2 is filling up that space. And they sort of sit there. Um, and you can get arthritis affecting that area, causing erosions and destruction and problems. And then what can happen is it can either migrate north or migrate uh, posteriorly into the spinal cord. And what happens when you get a spinal cord lesion at that level? Yeah, like that's what happens when you're you're being hung, right? And you fall, and like the stem pops up through your Unless it was like the good, the bad, and the ugly, where the guy gets hung, but the other guy shoots the string. That was their racket. Um, so when to think about this? It's when you see somebody with their x-ray looks like this, and their clinical exam, they've got really bad, terrible hands, which hopefully you don't see a lot anymore. But we do still have some patients with you know, didn't have access to medications or were in the generation before we had some of the highly effective uh, DMAR agents. Okay, so looking at the neck, you want to do flexion and extension x-rays. And then you have to know what you're looking for in these. So, again, here's C2, here's C1, the front of it. Okay. And then when this person's leaning forward, you see a gap forming here. There's usually no gap. And what's in that gap normally? Nothing, nothing important. But where is the problem area? It's back here, where this bone may start to poke into your spinal cord. Okay? So the red space, space available for the cord. Okay? So here there's the MRI looking at that kind of a thing. So when you have this, um, before you know what's going on, you want to say, all right, let's, let's hold off. Let's get dynamic of the neck to see ability at C1, C2. Oh. Um, the problem comes up when they flex and move the head in order to intubate, or just sometimes it happens, right? People come in. They've got bad rheumatoid arthritis. They've been having trouble walking. And now, all of a sudden, they're collapsing on the floor. And people go, well, their knee's really bad. Let me replace the knee. Still unable to do anything. And it's logic. All right. So um, another joint that we really just don't think about, um, but that I've been exercising during the last hour, is my cricoaretinoid joint. That's the joint that the vocal cords, and it turns out that sometimes in rheumatoid arthritis, cricoretinoids can get affected with rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. and then they get stuck. Um, and if they get stuck closed, what happens? Close your vocal cords totally. Yeah, you can't breathe, right? What will happen is it doesn't move very well intubate somebody, and then the tissue around there gets irritated and inflamed, and now it's stuck so that it can't open enough to ventilate. What's the symptom somebody has when they have an obstruction through the airway? 
Iron. Iron sandwich. Purple. Yeah. <laughs> you can make strawberry cookies. Makes you cough even to do it. Um, <clears throat> so this is somebody who their risk time is they've been intubated, but now it's post extubation and they suddenly start having strider. You see like bad rheumatoid arthritis and you're like, oh, I was really worried about the neck. And now you're hearing this. Think about cricoretinoid disease. They need to be intubated again. Um, so next, I'm going to quiz you about all the new drugs for rheumatoid arthritis, of which there are so many. Um, you need to know some little bit about these. Um, but the main thing is this one, anti-TNF therapy. Uh, there's five of them. The reason there's five is that they're highly effective. Everybody wants to get into the market. It's like, why are there five proton pump inhibitors? All so uh, the big problem with these would be reactivation of tuberculosis. Have time. Uh, it's nice now with the um, other problems that can occur. What you need to know about as an internist would be reactivation of TB. 